Okay, uh, welcome everyone and particularly welcome, welcome Mark Webb. Uh, Mark's given us a couple of presentations in the past based on his um, PhD research. Uh, uh, but tonight um, he's going to be talking to us about the Great Drapery, Drapers Hall, uh, and its uh, previous iterations. Um, it was Mark's suggestion that the Prince's uh, Foundation join in partnership with Heritage Coventry Trust uh, to restore Drapers Hall and has been responsible for, for uh, finding the majority of the funds. So, hell of a lot of hard work there. So now as uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Webb, having completed his uh, PhD research, um, he's going to uh, give us an overview and perhaps uh, also tell us about some other archaeological uh, finds that he's uh, come across whilst doing it. So over to you, Mark. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to share my screen here so we can see the presentation. Can you all see that? Good. So yeah, thank you for Vince for that introduction. Um, yeah, I, it's been about two or three years now since I actually presented to the Coventry Society on my PhD and I was pleased that I got my doctorate at the, in January. But um, that was from the University of Leicester. But my day job basically is working for the Prince's Foundation. So I thought I'd spend a couple of minutes a bit later on in the, in, in, in the presentation talking about who they are and why they're different from the Prince's Trust. Um, but I'm particularly involved in um, Draper's Hall and um, what this was is that um, you, it, so many people all around this uh, conference will know that there's been several attempts to try and get this scheme off the ground over the years. Um, and the Prince's Foundation had a project called Seven for Seventy, which commemorated the 70th birthday of the Prince of Wales. And some bright spark in the Prince's Foundation said, well, can't we do 70 projects to commemorate it? And then we said, well, we've never done 70 in our entire history, but we can do seven. Um, and I said, well, we, we really do need to have this one. There's a great project in Coventry called Draper's Hall. Um, and it was selected as one of the 70 from about well over 100 candidates. Um, so um, I'm really pleased that we're actually now at the stage where we're actually kind of almost reaching the home straight and it'll be open next year but we can talk about that later. So what you're looking at now on the left hand side is the um, elevation of the plan from uh, Rickman and Hutchison, the, the Birmingham architects. I think this was put together in 1830. The building itself was finished and opened in 1832. On the right hand side that is the elevation um, that the architect from the Prince's Foundation uh, put together and I'll explain a little bit about how we've we've gone from um, four columns to two a bit later on. Um, I'm also a trustee of Historic Coventry Trust so I've um, you know I've got a vested interest in making sure that uh, this, this is a project that, that goes ahead and I think um, Despite one or two little ups and downs along the way, I think it's been a good partnership between the Prince's Foundation and um, Historic Coventry Trust. Um, and I know that Carol Pyre is with us, so I'm sure she'll interject with uh, anything that I've missed out. Now I'm trying to work out how I move the screen on. Ah, here we are. So why is the building important? Well, um, first of all, it's a grade two star listed building, which is the second highest uh, building that you can, um, rating that you can get. And it's um, very high listing is largely based on its really opulent interiors. And this is a view taken a couple of years ago before any of the work was taken place. And even though a lot of, a lot of it has been boarded up and, um, you know, not in, in perfect condition, you can still see the grandeur of this building. I mean, it's like stepping into a, a Jane Austen novel. And you can just imagine what it would be like when um, everything is restored to how it looked in the 1830s. So um, opulent interiors and, and also 
the, the listing um, was given such a high grade because of its connection with the, the Coventry Drapers. And we all know that Coventry built its wealth in the medieval period on the back of sale of wool and woolen cloth and the Coventry Drapers were always very important. And when Coventry declined after the medieval period, the Drapers retained their importance even into the early 19th century, which allowed them to build such a, um, uh, such a, it must have been a very expensive at the time, hall, which is the third hall actually on the site. I'll talk about the other two a bit later on. So um, built in 1832, so that's in the Regency period. It's built in the Greek Revival style, and it's probably Coventry's best early 19th century building. Um, as I say, designed by Bir uh, Birmingham-based architects, um, Thomas Rickman and Henry Hutchinson. Um, now, a couple of interesting facts, particularly about um, Rickman. Um, he was very well known for being um, an architect of churches. Uh, he was also an antiquarian. He was particularly keen on, on Gothic architecture. And it's thanks to him that we have our classifications for the Gothic uh, period. So he invented the term Norman, Early English, Decorated and Perpendicular um, in, in, in a book that he produced um, a long time before he uh, got involved in Draper's Hall. But this is not a Gothic building, of course. It's, um, it's very much a kind of a late Georgian, early Victorian building. Um, he partnered with um, Henry Hutchinson um, in their, um, from 18, 1821, so 11 years before this was, was built. And unfortunately, um, Henry Hutchinson died the year before this was built. Um, the other interesting fact about the partnership is that um, they built this in Bath stone, which is very different, of course, from our Coventry red sandstone. And they also, um, were responsible for um, repairs to the exterior of Holy Trinity Church, also in Bath Stone, and Christ Church, which was of course destroyed in the war, but Christ Church was built around the medieval tower of Greyfriars. And if you look at the photographs of that, that was also in Bath Stone. So that was their favored building material. So, it's been a tragedy really that um, given the importance of the building that it's been empty for at least 30 years and largely unavailable for the citizens of Coventry to actually visit other than on open days. Um, but it has been kept to um, you know, reasonable standards and kept watertight by Coventry City Council. Um, but you can see where it's been deteriorating and it urgently needs help. So on the right hand side you've got you can see where um, the skylights have been boarded up and the paint's peeling off and on the on the left hand side we've got the original kitchen down there which is in, in a, is in a poor state but um, everything's pretty sound and it'll be, be restored and that particular room will be restored as a kitchen but used as a, um, uh, a practice room for for young people um, learning their uh, classical music and musical instruments. So now uh, we have a, a new um, future for Draper's Hall after several f false starts over the years. And it's going to be a music performance and education venue, mainly for young people, but uh, not exclusively. It'll be the um, home of Coventry Music, who are Coventry uh, currently based at the Old Quartals building. Um, and so they have potentially, they can reach over up to about 15,000 young people at schools, school age in, in Coventry and, and the surrounding area. Um, and we hope that they'll be able to expand their activities, do more, and the people, the young people who actually use Drapers Hall will be suitably inspired by their surroundings. I've mentioned before, this is a partnership between Historic Coventry Trust and the Prince's Foundation. Um, just a little bit about um, the, the hall itself and, and the current state. Um, it'll be open for performances 
um, when, when it is open next year, um, there are three main performance spaces, which I'll talk about later. The maximum will be 180. So we're talking not about a full orchestra, um, but chamber music um, and, and concerts. Um, and then the, the um, 1890s extension to the east, the, the brick building, that'll be um, mainly office space. Well, the whole of the building will be open also for community activities and antique fairs, hiring out for weddings. We're going to be doing tours. We would like the community to get involved in this and, and actually see the interiors as much as possible, even though the anchor tenant will be, as I say, the Coventry Music School. Um, we're hoping to restore it to its um, original state to the extent that we've actually um, done a, a historic paint survey, we've actually discovered what the original wall colourings were. Um, and also, um, one of the interesting things about Draper's Hall is there's a wealth of material in the Coventry Archive about the paint, the decoration, the furniture. Um, you know, there's, there's an awful, awful lot of information there that we're hoping to draw on to actually bring it back to its original state. And in fact, the Coventry Drapers who vacated the hall in 1960, have said that, that they can uh, return to the hall some of the original furniture and, and crockery, which would be fantastic. So a little bit about the Prince's Foundation. I thought I'd home in on this rather than talk about Historic Comedy Trust because uh, Historic Comedy Trust is very familiar to everybody. But the Prince's Foundation, um, I thought it'd be useful to talk about what we what we do and and how we're different from Prince's Trust. I'd say about 99 people out of 100 always refer to us as the Prince's Trust, which of course um, helps uh, young people get into employment, particularly in those from um, social and economic deprivation. But the Prince's Foundation is, is a different organisation, even though we have the same patron, the Prince of Wales who we can see here at Draper's Hall when he visited in January last year. And the Prince's Foundation is an amalgamation of four charities um, under the Prince. So the Prince's Regeneration Trust um, was set up in the mid nineties to restore historic buildings, usually in areas of social and economic deprivation and with the aim of turning, giving them a sustainable future um, and, and with a, a, a big emphasis on community use. Um, the Prince's School of Traditional Arts, there's the Prince's Foundation for Building Community, and then there's the, I don't know whether people know, in, in Scotland, in Ayrshire, there's Dumfries House, which is a Palladian mansion that was saved for the nation um, over 10 years ago. Um, that is our headquarters, even though I'm personally based in the um, office in Shoreditch in London. So you can see Prince Charles there looking in, in the ballroom, looking up at the skylights. Um, and in the blue there is the um, Prince's Foundation architect, Eva Pajersko, and Nicola Dyer, the project manager, who's, who's now left, but uh, she was able to, to show the Prince round in January last year. Um, on the right hand side, I've got a photograph there of our building craft students. So one of the things that we do is, um, one of the things I do actually, is find the money to give bursaries for young people who would like to um, upskill to become the next generation of stonemasons, carpenters, plasterers, blacksmiths. And all of these young people go on an eight month course, uh, which ends, ends in um, an MVQ3 um in heritage skills and nearly all of them um, get employment straight away afterwards usually with the people that they do an industrial placement with so we you know e each of these students probably have about two or three industrial placements over a four month period and some of them will be working on draper's hall which is great um in fact some, one or two will be working on charter house as well so we've got some of these young people now practicing their skills in Coventry, which is really good news. Um, and I think that's gonna be, gonna be happening in, in the late autumn um, and just before Christmas. So let's get our bearings about where we are because I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the history of the hall and its geographical context. 
So you've got here the um, Board of Health map of 1851, and you can see St. Michael's Church there, and then Bailey Lane um, uh, to the south, and then and veering down to Earl Street in that very distinctive curve. And Draper's Hall there is, is in, in pink. Um, and uh, to the west of um, Draper's Hall, you can see um, a road there which is labelled at that point as Half Moon Yard or Half Moon Street, I think. Uh, that was later replaced in 1863 by St Mary Street. Um, but that was the location of the great medieval drapery. Um, it's very, very important. The second largest cloth market in the whole country after London, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute. And I think it's something that we should talk, talk more about actually in Coventry and, and celebrate and, and have a bit more in, ter in terms of interpretation, perhaps even by um, having some interpretation on the site itself. The two images on the right were both um, drawn in the 1820s and they both show different views of um, Bailey, Bailey Lane. So the top one you can see is looking east with St Michael's um, to, the, to, the, to the left. And then the bottom one is a brook, is from the Brook album, looking north. And those buildings on the left actually survived, as well, one of them did anyway, and, uh, as late as 1939 um, and was destroyed um, as part of the Gibson plan. It was going to be the site of the um, art museum and art gallery, but in the end they decided the other side of the road. So um, it was actually knocked down for, for no good purpose. Um, but there are moves afoot to see if we can try and reconstruct it. So the Great Drapery, as I mentioned, you know, really important, but you wouldn't know it by looking down St Mary Street today. I mean, there's absolutely nothing to indicate the, its importance. And we talked a little bit earlier about that um, blank wall on the left. I do wonder, it'd be very interesting to get ideas about how we might be able to make that wall a little bit more interesting and mark its historical importance in some way. I think, I think that's some, something we can, we can uh, have a think about. And on the right is what was uh, when St Mary Street was built in 1863, the, um, the old, what was then the old police station. Um, at right at the back you've got the architect's building from 1960. But the drapery was really important. Um, it actually um, at one point um, had 35 stalls or shops they weren't temporary. It sounds like that we don't know what the whole building looked like, but it was a it was a permanent structure. We we've got documentation that actually uh, refers to repairs, for example, to the tiling, which suggests it was a, a permanent structure structure, possibly of two levels. Um, on either side of that um, that passageway, there it probably extended a little bit further to uh, into what is now the the, the old council house. But even so, it was quite a narrow structure. Um, it moved to this location in around about 1341. It was originally at the top of Pilgrim's Lane. Um, but this was all part of Queen Isabella, the widow of Edward II's um, plans for, um, um, for boosting Coventry as a, as a, a really important centre for um, wool sales. And she um, encouraged um, one of her friends, William Welshman, to provide a tenement with shops on either side near the, the, the current Draper's Hall to use as the drapery. Um, the, there were also some, also some stalls on the south side of St Michael's Church, so it's extended beyond what is now St Mary's Street. Um, there was also a wool hall um, to the right and a Welsh wool market and quite importantly, on the left-hand side, a searching house. Now, we think that was found in excavation in 2008. Um, quite an important um, structure, a stone structure was, was uncovered. It's almost certainly was the searching house, which is where Coventry cloth was searched or, or inspected for quality, which was really important for Coventry because so, obviously Coventry was important for its 
fine um, Coventry blue cloth, but lots of places in the country tried to imitate it. They tried to rip us off. So we, um, only true Coventry blue was, was, was actually available if it was sealed in the searching house with a seal which had the, ele the um, elephant and castle on it. That was the only way to actually, um, uh, to sig signify that that was true Coventry cloth. And the, uh, the Coventry authorities, we know this from the leak book, were very, very strict um, ab ab about that. Um, the, the drapers were very important in the, in the medieval period, of course, they, they were the, with the mercers, the two most important trades uh, members of the, the ruling oligarchy. And they obviously had a, the, the big drapers chapel in St. Michael's. And there we have the tomb um, of Julian Nethermill, who was a draper in the 1820s, who actually I mean, just demonstrates Coventry's wealth. He was the fourth wealthiest man in the country. And he owned a lot of the property around where Draper's Hall is now. And that was his um, elaborate tomb there in St. Michael's. Unfortunately, it was destroyed in the war. It's a real shame. It'd be nice to be able to recreate that tomb in some way. Um, the drapery declined in the mid 16th century. Um, there were lots of vacancies. And finally, it was demolished in 1728. And um, we know a lot about the drapery, not just from the leak book and other documents, but also from archaeology, particularly this um, excavation that took place in 1988 to 9, just really behind where Draper's Bar is now. Um, so not hard up against Draper's Hall, but uh, nearer towards Draper's Bar. Um, it was arguably the most important excavation, that, um, archaeological excavation that's ever happened in Coventry. Um, but unfortunately ran out of money to produce the results, to, to publish the results. Um, but the site um, records do still exist and all the soil samples still exist. Um, there were incredibly important environmental finds there that actually has the potential to tell the story of Coventry's um, you know, natural history over the last 1000 years. Um, so what we did, at, you know, what medieval Coventry have done is actually employed the Museum of London Archaeology, MOLA, to actually have a look at the site survey and uh, the soil samples to see everything was intact. Um, the soil samples have actually been kept in sealed containers and remarkably after 30 years they are still in perfect condition. So what I'm trying to do is raise the money to try and get those soil samples analysed and the whole of the excavation published um, because it certainly deserves it. Um, in what, we, what we're looking at here is evidence of workshops um, probably from the 14th century. There's a Fuller's workshop there. Um, Fuller's were where it was, they prepared the cloth before it was sold, quite often trampling the cloth in smelly um, uh, liquids including urine um, but by the 15th century the authorities have had enough of that and they banished that kind of activity to the periphery in places like Spon Street. Um, so then the drapery went up market and the only kind of industry that was found there in, from the 15th century on was um, intricate metalworking to make belts and um, um, brooches. There was a gold, there were four goldsmiths nearby and a pewterer so um, it was mainly retail, but with high level metalworking. So then um, you can see a further excavation took place last year, this time a little bit further north and right next to the back, the, the rear of Draper's Hall. Um, again by, by Mola and um, it was quite a touching moment that Ray, I don't know how many people know, remember Ray Woolwick, who was the head excavator from the 1988-9 um, excavation. I brought him along to actually see last year's excavation and he was able to, to meet some of his former colleagues there. I mean, it's Paul Thompson and, and Steve Parry. A lot of people will, will remember and know. 
So that was that was a nice moment. And we, we have promised him that we will do what we can to publish his, uh, uh, his excavation results. The, 19, the 2019 excavations were a little bit disappointing. They, you can see from the photograph, they weren't able to go down as deep as, as in the 1980s, partly for health and safety reasons. And the finds were not quite exciting, but they, you know, they did find um, evidence of other workshops and, and some very nice artifacts, including some um, very nice um, um, from crockery from the, from the drapery in, in, in 1980, in the 18, um, 1830s. So the first Draper's Hall um, was actually, it was actually built after the medieval period. It was built on the present site in the 1630s. Uh, on land given to the Draper's Company by a draper called Henry Sewell on his death. Um, and he had bought the um, properties from the Nethermill family. So I remember he's the one man that had the, um, the tomb in, in the Draper's Chapel. Um, it was very narrow. You can see where it stands in relation to the, the curve of Bailey Lane. Um, and in 1759, when this plan was to put together, it was described as being a very dark and gloomy edifice because there were very few windows and uh, we don't know whether there's skylights, but um, it wasn't very well lit. So it was replaced um, in 1775 by a second hall, a um, classical hall, you can see here, by Thomas Crouchman, 1775. It had a slightly bigger footprint to the east. east but again, there were no windows. You can see the arches there, they're all blocked up. They were just niches, not, uh, not full windows. Um, it didn't last very long. It suffered from dry rot and it was demolished in 1830. So then that brings us to the third Draper's Hall, the one that we know and love. Um, this is Rickman and Hodgson's new plan in 1828. Um, in the style of a Greek temple, and you can see there there were the, 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 the four columns. So there were originally two entrances aligned with the four classical columns and visitors ascended the stairs into a vestibule where um, there was the card room, the tea room and the ballroom, which still exist. Um, they got over the lack of light by um, building um, really impressive um, roof lanterns, which we're hoping to restore um, as part of the restoration. Um, in the 1840s, there were, the Minstrels Gallery in the ballroom was extended. In 1855, the hall was redecorated. And in 1864, they decided to use the, that front room there as, as a, the card room, as, as a reading room. So they, um, they knocked out the two columns um, and actually built, a, you know, built out in the Victorian period to create more light. And then in 1890, to the east, the, the brick um, east um, extension that circles around Bailey Lane was built, including a new summoner's accommodation, ladies' cloak room. Um, and I think that was the last um, uh, addition to Draper's Hall, so that by 1890, that the the hall is as it as it as it is today. So the later history is also very in interesting. Um, a lot of people may know that it was used um, as a as an air raid shelter during the Second World War, and in fact that's a, a, an image <coughs> of a, a Second World War poster that was down in in the, in the depths. Um, one or two of you have probably been down there with torches during previous Heritage Open Days. Of course, that's now been opened up. Um, lots of light there now while, they, um, while the builders uh, convert it into practice rooms for the, for the musicians. Um, interestingly, when the um, listing system came in, in 1947 Town and Country Planning Act, Covent Draper's Hall was not even nominated to be listed. It wasn't a given statutory listing, um, and so therefore it was always at risk of demolition. And in fact, we know under the Gibson plan, there were, um, there were some plans to actually build um, 
roads coming coming into the centre. Um, Falls Hospital, for example, was under threat. Um, and so was Draper's Hall. They were going to actually build a, a road through the site and knock the hall down. But then in 1952, it received a compulsory purchase order. Um, and the Draper's Company uh, and others, other guilds in Coventry, objected very strongly. So that kind of put a break on, on the city council's plans to destroy the hall. <clears throat> and then finally, when a relisting happened in 1957, um, the experts and, and, and um, actually recognised how important it was, and it was given a grade two listing, um, partly pushed by the Georgian group, who were very powerful in the 1950s. And uh, we actually have a series of photographs of what the building looked like from the National Building Survey. Um, with um, the furniture intact and the mirrors and the, and the windows. But despite the grade two listing, um, the council still wanted to knock it down. Um, and in 1960, the Draper's Court Company um, vacated the hall and sold off all the fixtures and fittings, including the chandeliers, which I'll come on to later. Um, and the, the hall was <clears throat> taken over by the corporation but they decided to use it rather than knock it down it became a magistrate's court in the 1960s and 70s and in that in 1980s part of it was used by cv1 by 1997 the hall was officially redundant uh, despite having the, the occasional temporary uses and i've come across so many people who've said they used different parts of the hall for changing rooms and and various other things but generally it's been un, um, unavailable for the public to view for at least 30 years. And then in 2005, <clears throat> there was a previous scheme from the Higgs charity in Coventry University um, to actually restore the hall. It was a much bigger scheme than the one that is currently on the table, but that, as we know, that fell through. <clears throat> so, um, I mentioned this is a, a partnership between Historic Coventry Trust and the Prince's Foundation. So people may be interested at, about where the money's come from. Um, the whole scheme to restore the hall, but excluding um, a, a modern, um, a new build extension, which was originally part of the plan, is actually going to be is around about four and a half million pounds. So about Two million of that has come from Culture Capital, which is basically the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, together with um, City Council. Uh, the DCMS gave Hull, when it was City of Culture, um, quite a lot of money to um, upgrade its um, historic fabric and, and facilities, and they've done the same for Coventry, although we had to apply for it. Um, and then uh, about a million's come from Arts Council England, and then various other tr um, trusts and foundations, uh, the Prince of Wales Charitable Foundation as well, Garfield Weston, Foyle Wolfson, I should have put on there, it, that's the one that's missing. So um, bit by bit we've managed to, to pull, pull together all the, all the money. <clears throat> so the plans basically um, mentioned that's going to be three main performance spaces, the ballroom seats 180 people, the tea room 90 people and the reading room 45 people. Um, it's going to be the home of Coventry Music. Um, they will be doing lunchtime concerts which will be fantastic um, but using the um, practice spaces um, in the lower ground floor and uh, there'll be storage there for instrument hire. Um, we hope also the, the central location will encourage more young people to take part. But, you know, we really do think that the opulent and um, elevated surroundings will inspire more young people to take part. But it won't just be young people as well. There'll be um, opportunities for all. So, for example, the Armonico Concert um, Orchestra, who are based at Warwick, <clears throat> they already do, do a lot of work with young people in... Coventry but they also do choral work with older people um, and they've got um, a scheme whereby they work with major organisations in Coventry like the, the, um, the NHS, um, 
and other other large organizations to create um, corporate choirs so they're, they're recruiting others as well um, there's also going to be a strong connection with the university in terms of music teaching and, and study um, and we do hope as well there'll be some community events we'll be doing tours uh, the the, um, the main ballroom will be um, a site for um, antique fairs, exhibitions, um, and of course it will all be play a very strong part in the proceedings for City of Culture. We hope that the building, it, the the, the, um, the renovation work is going at quite a pace now. The contractor is Jay Tomlinson. They are predicting that they will have it ready by um, March next year and we're hoping to open in April so just in time for City of Culture and we're rather hoping that the Prince of Wales will come along and actually give it an official opening at that stage. Now I mentioned the chandeliers um, they were sold off in 1960 um, and we've tracked them down and they're now available for sale, would you believe, in a London auction, um, antique shop in Kensington. They've been in storage for years and years and years and only last year they brought them out and spent a lot of money on restoring them. There are four. So you can see a few of us there in the, it's like Aladdin's cave in this shop. So one of the, the four chandeliers is, is, is there. That's just one of them. And also some of the light fittings from Draper's Hall have been restored or on sale as well. We would love to be able to buy them, <laughs> but the four of them together cost about 180,000 pounds. So we think the money is better spent on making sure the hall is, is, is in a good state to, to be opened. But we do hope that if secretly, if, if, if a, a major benefactor came along and is prepared to spend the money, then that would be great before the, the uh, chandeliers get sold off, possibly even individually and split up to people because the, uh, you know, the chandeliers are now on sale in the auction house, in the antique shop. So I think that's it really. If, um, very exciting. It, it does look finally as if Draper's Hall will be open after all these years. Um, so open to any questions. Okay, shall we do this in an orderly fashion? Can people indicate if they'd like to speak and I'll make a list and we'll try and go through them. Jim, is that you saying yes? Start with Jim and then Peter. Oh, sorry, Paul Maddox. Phil. Uh, you mentioned that there was an earlier attempt at restoration were you able to draw on the work that they did uh, as a basis to start the uh, proposals uh, this time around? Yes, we were actually, and the, you know, they, um, the previous scheme leaders were very generous in, in allowing us to use their conservation plan, and their, uh, you know, it got us off to a good start. So we absolutely, even though their scheme was much bigger, we were able to utilise the, the the section, you know, the um, their plans for um, restoring the hall as it sta now stands. So yeah, yes, it was. We, we probably saved about 200,000, quarter of a million pounds that way. Um, Paul, Paul Maddox. You're saying that there was a record of what colours inside the building. Was there wall hangings or wallpaper or anything like that? Or was it just coloured walls? We think it was coloured walls, but there, there is evidence that there may have been a wall mural. Um, somebody earlier in the conversation mentioned about um, the, the, you know, the, the, the muses. Um, we know that they were painted on somewhere in the ballroom, but we don't know where. And they, so far, they haven't been discovered. And it'd be interesting to, if we did discover them, what we'd do with them, whether we'd keep them. But um, as far as we know, it was it was all one colour. They they changed the colour in um, eighteen fifty five, and again I think in the in the sometime in the twentieth century, 
So uh, if you remember now, it's a kind of a kind of bit of an off green color, but that wasn't the original color. <clears throat> it was more of a, 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 a white, an off white color originally. Uh, Phil? Oh, hi. Uh, yeah, in the, uh, the cellar area, that's gonna be the, the education and practice area, are there any plans to, um, to restore or to keep the Second World War um, fittings and decor, such as the, you know, like the poster, the, the health poster, information posters that you showed, and to do, like include that as part of the heritage? Well, uh, yes, is the answer. And I think I mean, there's, there's two posters down there, to my knowledge. I believe they've actually been carefully lifted and taken away. I could be wrong, perhaps Carol uh, will, will correct me there. But they, they, you know, we, we, they will try and preserve as much as possible. And what we'd like to do is actually um, display quite a bit about the history of the hall and its role in the Second World War is, is, is one of the most important and interesting aspects so we're hoping that we'll be able to do some thorough interpretation so that even if we can't necessarily show people into those rooms or show them the posters, there'll be enough information for people to get the idea about what it what it once looked like. Brilliant, um, thanks. David, David Fry? Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, Mark, if by the time that they were actually building this uh, latest Drapers Hall, um, how many of the members were actually drapers, or was it a bit of an old? Uh, was it a bit of a sort of businessman's club? I think it was a businessman's club. Yeah, um, you know, I think there's a lot of them were. Um, you know, it, it was the meeting point, the social rooms for the middle classes of Coventry in, in the 1830s. So you've got all the silk weavers there. There's a connection, I think, with George Eliot and, and, and the George Eliot's kind of circle. So I, I, it'd be interesting to actually find out how many drapers were involved, how many members there were, and I think that we may be able to find that out through the records. But it, was, it wasn't exclusively a drapers club, it was social rooms for the middle class elite of, um, of Coventry. Okay, thanks. Um, Les, do you want to ask your question again publicly that you asked at the start? Yes, thank you. Am <clears throat> I... Uh, heard by everyone? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I uh, suggested to the uh, Princess Trust lady, who is now left, I believe, Nicola somebody, who, uh, that uh, that blank wall facing the council house could do with something to enliven it. And it can't have windows in because it doesn't suit the, the, the function as a music place and the plasters inside don't line up anyway. <coughs> so I suggested we use the five muses, four of which are in the Herbert Museum, and one is in a private garden somewhere in Wales, who's willing to donate it to decorate that face of the building. It wouldn't be ideal because it'd still be facing the council house and people who are walking down St Mary Street would still be looking at the uh, the ruins, the, the old the old uh, cathedral. Les, these were the yeah. um, Les, were these the muses that were on the art college? Yes, four of them were in the Herbert Art Gallery, which they're willing to give up if someone can display them, and one is in a private garden in Wales. So. I'm not sure if that's the best solution, but it just occurred to me as a great way of livening up that blank uh, elevation. Remember that when um, the the um, Breakers Hall was built, it was against another building. So that wall is a blank wall against another building. But the council house of built in St Mary Street was created, leaving a blank wall. Uh, Mark? Well, uh, that's, that's absolutely true. I didn't know about the five muses. Uh, you know, that's an interesting thing that we should have a look at. And I'll speak to uh, Eva, our architect. I mean, one thing I, I, I thought about as well is actually commemorating in some way the history of that stretch of road as the Great Drapery. And I did meet, just before lockdown, um, 
company that um, may be able to make some terracotta figures. Um, and I described the history of the drapery and they thought they may be able to create something that you could place against the wall that would, um, that would blend in with the, the brick that would actually refer to the mercantile past. But, you know, nothing has been decided and, you know, it's, it's quite interesting to, to see what potentially we could do. I, think we, I agree we should do something. And of course, there's the space behind Draper's Hall as well. There are plans for that, but certainly for you know, a, a temporary period of a year or two years, that can be utilized for all sorts of things. Great. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah. Would like to ask a question, Vince? Yeah, a couple of quickies. Just, just as a matter of interest, this uh, thing about the country blue is that is that the origin of the phrase true blue? It certainly is. Yes. Um, oh, good. Uh, and se secondly, you talked the about the the fine metal working that went on there. Mm. Uh, would would the, the the last vestiges of that have been? Um, Mildred Murphy and Winifred King's workshops in the Earl Street Courtyard until Third Reich demolitions got hold of it. Yeah, I don't know. It'd be interesting to actually trace the history of Coventry's kind of metalworking. It was um, in the late medieval period, in the 15th century, it was one of the top half dozen fine metalworking um, cities in, in the country. And in fact, for a period, it actually was one of four cities that actually had its own mint. Um, granted by Edward IV, it's probably on the site of now the Golden Cross pub. So I, I don't, of course, the dissolution, you know, the, the, in the 16th century did destroy a huge amount of the demand for that because um, a lot of the fine metal working was for, um, for, the, for the churches and the cathedral. Of course, that went away. So I would imagine there would have been a break between the medieval period and the 19th and 20th centuries, but I don't know, it'd be interesting to, to look. Uh, and in terms of why Coventry is called True Blue, it's, it's because Coventry had a special technique of not only dyeing the cloth blue, but making sure that you could wash it again and again and again, and the blue didn't fade. Unlike my jeans. Yes. <laughs> so um, that was another reason why it was called True Blue. Yeah, the, the, the Murphy and uh, King workshops were in the old uh, Earl Street courtyard and they were certainly old medieval timber buildings. Interesting, yeah. Oh, well, that's, uh, that's something to, uh, to, to research then. Okay. Yeah, we're, 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 already, well, we're already adding that to our research on them. Oh, great, right. uh, fantastic. Uh, the, the other thing, you're talking about the, um, the results of the, uh, ex the previous excavation at the back there. Yeah. Uh, haven't been published, etc. I mean, what kind of what kind of cost are we talking about to get the to get that job done? Well, very good question, and you'd be amazed how expensive it actually is. And the first estimate I was given was ninety thousand pounds. One nine or nine zero. Nine zero ninety thousand pounds. Flipping heck! Six months work. Um, to actually analyze the finds, um, you know, make sure that they're all in different places and then actually write the whole thing up. Um, we think we may have got it down to probably about 45, 50, we, you know, particularly if we focus on the medieval as opposed to the post medieval. Yeah. Um, but the encouraging thing is that as a result of what we've done with MOLA, we know the results are there. They're just waiting to be, you know, the, the story is waiting to be told. So if we can find that money, I think it'd be absolutely amazing. Or well, maybe we should get together and have a campaign. Yeah, good idea. Thanks okay. very much, Mark. Any more questions? Put your hand up. John's iPad, if you'd like to. Yeah, um, Mark, uh, you talked about the four chandeliers. Uh, did you mention which antique shop they're in at the moment? <laughs> uh, are you thinking of buying them then? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm trying you to might say that, I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think, I, I do know it, and I, I, if, if you want me to email it to you, I can do. I'm trying, struggling to yep, think of it. Please. Oh, I know, I can think of it. It's Denton Antiques. Denton Antiques, where are they? They're in Kensington. Ouch. 
Damn it, I would say, say yeah. That they've offered them to us for 180,000 for all four. Yeah, I've just wanted to, you know, um, that, that, that's, that's what they're offering, that's what they're asking at the moment, but you know, they, they may do a Sainsbury's three for the price of two or something or whatever. We've, we've tried that and they're, they're playing hardball. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Denton. Right. Was there any more, were there any more questions? Graham and Janice. Janice. You need to unmute yourself, yeah. Janice. I just wanted to say, with regard to the bare wall, I know this probably is no use, but um, walking around just the area where the Peeping Tom is, in a, just off Earl Street, um, a couple of, about 18 months ago, there were bare windows, and they filled the bare windows up with um, great um, drawings and, and, and history so that they looked as though they were just panels. It might be interesting to have something like that on the outside to say what the background, as someone said before, what the background history was in a more modern way, but describing the history, because I found that they were filling up the empty spaces to make them look more uh, appealing. Um, but I thought that was really lovely. I really enjoyed reading. Just just a small synopsis of what the history of the building is. It's probably useless, but I just wanted to say that. No, a really good idea. And, it, you know, uh, we've definitely got to do something to, you know, I mean, how many other cities can say that they had the largest and most important cloth market outside London? And absolutely. Yet absolutely. Absolutely nothing there to actually tell you about it. No. So if we can actually tell that story, and as you say, in a, in a kind of a modern and appealing way, I think that'd be well worth doing. Well, I, I'm a I'm a true Coventry in all my life, right from before I was born, I think. Um, but I still found that very, very uh, really interesting just to read in the small little pocket what the history of Coventry was. Yes, uh, absolutely. And, you know, I, that, that's one of the reasons why I set up the Medieval Coventry Charity, because so often Coventry is really important medieval past has yeah. been ignored in favour yeah. of the Blitz and post-war reconstruction and um, there's, people are amazed when they come uh, you know there are fragments you have to sometimes work hard to understand it all yeah. but it's it's it repays the effort and and Coventry's medieval art and architecture and history is as important as anywhere else I agree um, so we should know more definitely Trevor Cornfoot and then Peter Garber. <coughs> Trevor, you need to unmute yourself. You um, talked about the music uses that are going to be in the building and a range of other uses. Uh, can you just say something about how the building is going to be managed and uh, what priority is going to be given to the various uses you suggested? Well, um, the, you know, the prior, it's priority in, in, in the sense that they will be anchor tenants will be Coventry Music, of course, because they're moving out of their Quartals um, headquarters at the moment. Um, but it'll be open to other, um, it, it, you know, it, it, there'll be concerts all the time, not just by Coventry Music, by, but by others. Um, the whole hall will be managed um, and I know that the tender has gone out. I, I don't know what the conclusion is of that for, for somebody to actually manage the hall. Right. I think one of the, the major um, aspects to it, and, and it's a condition of our funding, is that the, the, the hall is, is available for use for the community. So we don't want it to go for another 30 years without people from Coventry being able to have a look inside. Yeah. Yeah. We want to invite people in. Hey, Peter Garbett. But um, if you've already explained it, because I can't hear the volume very well. But what, what is happening with the piece of land between uh, Drapers Hall and Drapers Boromark? I, I didn't quite hear that, but are you asking about the space between Drapers Hall and Drapers Bar? Yes, what's happening yeah. with the land between them? Well, um, 
There are there are plans to. I mean, originally there was going to be a, a new build extension to the rear of Draper's Hall, which we you know we couldn't raise enough money, but it's not out of the question that might that might get built at some stage. Um, then um, you know there is the, the future of Draper's Bar, um, and I know that there are plans for that, but certainly for a period of a couple of years, while all these things. Um, Kind of unfold. Um, we will be making use of that that green space. So Draper's Bar, for example, during um, City of Culture will be what we call an, an urban room, a meeting place, and, and cafe. And on the first floor, there's going to be an exhibition about Coventry's built heritage. And we may be able to do um, activities associated with that exhibition in the green space. So I'm looking, I'm curating the medieval section of that. So I'd like there to be things like um, uh, recreations of, of, of medieval textile making, for example. And on the, the modern side, there's an idea that we can recreate the exhibition of 1945, where a, a large proportion of the city actually came and visited to, to have a look at the post-war reconstruction plans and then invite people to say, well, you know, did what they proposed in 1945 come to fruition? And, and how would we like to change things in the future? So there's lots of ideas going around. I mean, there's even talk about actually having um, almost like a, a cinema, having um, projections on, on the rear wall of, of Draper's Hall. But um, it's all open to, for suggestion. Uh, we'll, we'll have to make our minds up in the next six months. But if anybody's got some good ideas, then we'd be very happy to hear. Okay. Um, John Greatrix, uh, do you want to come back in? Thank you very much. Um, Mark, um, can I just ask you, um, if I wanted to put a suggestion to the um, Prince's Foundation, um, could I go have a chat with you uh, to get some advice on how to proceed with that, please? Yes. Um, we, we'll, we'll exchange emails afterwards and then and, and take it from there, definitely. There is a Coventry connection. It, was a, it just happened to be a, a structure that was designed by the MP for Coventry um, from 1854 to 19, 1865, a chap called Paxton. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, um, we'll end the questions there. Um,